I really want to start with a simple question. My friend Jack Atkin asked me, what is waste? And for me, waste is in the eye of the beholder. Next slide. In nature, there's really no such thing as waste. Every uh, component of, of cell material is cycled and recycled. Nitrogen, carbon, water, energy is continually cycled in nature. Uh, waste is a human idea. And in fact, in Sweden, they have a slogan, which is that waste is just a resource in the wrong place. Cities have a different model, though. We have become wasteful by uh, becoming so good at getting rid of waste. We make it disappear. And in that way, we have the appearance of a clean home, a clean uh, city, and so on. But what happens at the other end is a completely different story. Waste, I think, pollutes twice. The obvious is what happens in the receiving environment, at an outfall or in landfill. But the hidden story is what happens upstream. If we throw something out, the embodied energy is lost to us. We then go upstream to mine new resources to replace what we've just discarded. That once through model is just the way we work. We've been like that since at least, <clears throat> at least World War II, where our economy has depended on cycling through uh, material in that way. Sweden, however, uh, is not blessed with oil as we are. Uh, they're not blessed with huge space to throw things away with. And so they've become much more conservative. If we can close the loops in our cities to make them much more the way that nature works, we would reduce our overall footprint, and not only the footprint caused by the pollution from waste, but also the footprint caused by our demands and resources. So a simple example is that we draw our drinking water today from the Souk Reservoir. It's predicted that by 2050 and possibly sooner with climate change, that reservoir will be tapped out, the growth and so on, and we'd then be looking at the Leech River, which has problems. Uh, first, there's the impact on the river itself, then there's the economics of a $100 million plant to take the water from the river. On the other hand, if we begin to reuse water, not for drinking necessarily, but for irrigation, for processed water and so on, we could postpone that upgrade, or what we would call an upgrade. We could postpone that uh, devastation of another river system. So that's the idea of closing the loop. Now we can do the same thing with carbon. We know how to do it with pop cans. We're very good at understanding that the embodied energy and material in an aluminum can is worth a tremendous amount to us, and it's far more economical to recycle that than to go mine more bauxite in Australia. Uh, but we're not so good at doing that with carbon, and that's the reason for the trip to Sweden. I had to figure out how they'd done this. Okay. So the thing with carbon is to understand that there's current carbon and fossil carbon, and I know many of you know this, but uh, I've met lots of students who don't, so I thought I'd quickly explain that fossil carbon is a one-way trip. We take it from the Earth, it's been there for two or three billion years, and it goes into the atmosphere. And the issue with that, of course, is it's uh, accumulating in the atmosphere, causing climate change. The uh, biofuels that I'll be talking about tonight are made of current carbon, and simply put, the material that I'm talking about, which is organic waste to landfill and sewage, is material that grew in the spring, and it drew its carbon from the atmosphere in the year that it was consumed. So we grow the food in the spring, we discard the orange peel in the fall, and that goes to landfill, or it goes to produce biofuel. If it produces biofuel, the result is that it displaces fossil fuels. And by doing that, we're not loading the atmosphere with carbon from, from the ground. It's current carbon, so-called. So it's a closed cycle. That's the benefit of the biofuels. So the trip to Sweden was uh, brief. Last October I had 10 days. Uh, the thing that really struck me was how generous Swedes were with their time. I started out in Stockholm with the Swedish uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the Swedish Energy Agency. They explained their policies for climate change, their policies for reducing pollution. And if you're interested in this, I'd really encourage you to go to the Swedish EPA website and start with their 16 environmental objectives. At the top of the list is climate change. And then from there is air quality, livable communities, uh, not putting organic material in landfill, preserving marine environments, and so on. But the interesting thing is all 16 are connected. You can't separate one from the other and see it as a distinctly separate objective. They're all tied together. They explain their carbon tax, which uh, favors biofuel and makes it more difficult to, uh, to burn oil. They explain their green electricity trading certificate system and so on. The interesting thing is that by the time I got to Gothenburg, though, uh, the next stop, uh, the city manager there said, that's all very nice, but you know, it doesn't matter to us what the federal policies are because the economics of resource recovery, the economics of not wasting the material are so compelling, we would have done them without the federal incentives. The interesting thing too is that each city had tailored its waste recovery to suit its own needs. So in Stockholm, the big issue there was air pollution from vehicles. In Gothenburg, the issue had been air pollution from oil burners for uh, heating, for heating plants. 
And in Christianstad, a smaller community of about 75,000, uh, well, 35,000 core, 75,000 for the whole community. Uh, their issue was actually getting rid of organic waste. They are a food center for Sweden. They do a tremendous amount of uh, processing of food. Uh, they have a slogan that every day in Sweden, someone eats something grown in Christianstad. So they have a lot of waste to get rid of. And for them, the challenge was getting rid of the waste. So starting again with, with Stockholm, uh, I did a, a tour of their largest waste treatment plant. And uh, the first lesson for me out of that was that planning for a waste treatment plant is community planning. It has nothing to do with technology. It has very little to do with uh, the business of treating the output. We will for sure have compliant effluent. You know, Duane and the engineering community he works with will certainly make sure we comply with regulations. But what you're looking at on the hill behind me is uh, the sewage plant, the largest sewage plant in Stockholm. And the only evidence that it's a plant is the small, the uh, tall stack there, which takes fumes to uh, higher levels. Sitting on top of it, you can see an apartment block. It has 1,600 people in it. And they've never had an odor complaint from their plant. It's one of the largest in Europe. And uh, the interesting thing about it is the way it's adapted to its community, which is uh, striking. You're looking at uh, a couple of uh, tremendous engineers uh, for the sewage plant. The one on the left is Dr. Marta Tendag, and her title is the Business Development Manager, which is a unique title for someone who runs a, a part of a sewage plant. But her mission in life is to sell the resources from the plant into the community. So uh, she realized that she was using some of the biogas uh, from the plant production itself to heat plant processes, and that, in fact, it was cheaper for her to buy that energy from a local energy company. The energy company gets that heat from waste sources. One of their largest waste sources is heat pumps running from the effluent. And so the, uh, if you think about that cycle, what's happening is the warm effluent goes to the energy company, they run heat pumps on it, extract heat, send some of that back to the sewage plant, which lets the plant then sell their gas to the bus company. Uh, Dr. Tendag couldn't get cooperation from the gas company to build the pipeline, so she built her own, and uh, then proceeded from there to start fueling the buses in Stockholm. When I was there in October, they had 30 buses running on biogas strictly from the sewage plant. Uh, by Christmas, it had gone up to 51, and they're heading to 200. The brilliant thing about this is that every time they add another biogas-powered bus in Stockholm, they displace an ethanol-powered bus out to the suburbs. Uh, they buy their ethanol from Brazil. It comes from corn. They prefer not to do that because it still carries a carbon sin, if you like. We invest carbon to grow corn. And uh, when the ethanol bus arrives in the suburbs, it retires a fossil uh, diesel-powered bus. So they're greening the city, if you like, from the inside out. There is a trick to how they do this. Uh, people in Stockholm didn't suddenly become four times more productive with sewage. The trick is that uh, they're taking organic waste, which is banned from landfills in Sweden. It was banned in 2005. They're taking that waste, uh, chopping it up, and sending it to the digester in the sewage plant. So Duane and I haven't talked too much about how these plants work, but very briefly, the sewage comes in, uh, we add air, the bugs digest the sewage. After they've done that, they die and you have sludge. The sludge is the biosolids. If you add to that sludge organic waste that comes from kitchens, from food factories and so on, you enrich the fuel for the uh, biogas digester and can produce more fuel. That's how they're doing it. So 200 buses from biogas in Stockholm, that's the goal. They also send gas over to a development called Hammerby Schulstad. And Hammerby Schulstad is very much like our dockside green here. It was built, or designed rather, with uh, the intent of having a low eco footprint, uh, using less water than other um, communities. And it, um, <clears throat> it also takes gas from the uh, sewage plant, for heat, not for heating, but actually for cooking. And the interesting thing about that cycle is that it also has a way of collecting organic waste uh, with vacuum pipes, and these pipes are really suited for a high-density community. But what they do is simply take the waste that people source separate and uh, send it to an underground collection point, and increasingly, Dr. Tendag is taking that waste and putting it back into the sewage plant. So you can see another example of a closed eco-cycle going in that community. That's the high-tech way of getting the waste into the plant. The low-tech way is with uh, bins on the side of the road, just as Toronto is doing, and I think that uh, Duane, is it true, Oak Bay has a pilot going? and view royal at the moment. So, you know, it's something that people can certainly do. In Sweden, uh, there is an incentive to do it because you pay a great deal more for your waste if you don't source separate. So the third lesson I took away from this trip 
was that the Swedes are very cleverly solving more than one problem at once. So they realized these digesters that uh, process biosolids in their sewage plants can also be used to divert waste from landfills. So it's two for one, and when they're doing that, they're not just taking the waste away from the landfill and preventing pollution there. They're displacing pollution which would have occurred from fossil fuels, and they're also preventing, or they're doing their part, if you like, to prevent climate change. It was a bit embarrassing in Stockholm, the Swedish EPA people showed me a chart with uh, their shift from 1990 in Canada's. Uh, we're up 24% and they're down 4%. Christianstad has made, um, it's almost a passion for them, this business of biogas. They have two digesters. One is purely for waste from uh, kitchens and so on, and one is for the, from the sewage plant. Uh, but to date, they run all of their buses on biogas. It's 21 buses, plus all the school buses, plus 10 city trucks, uh, plus, so far, 10 taxis. Uh, the fellow who showed me around Christianstad has an interesting title. He's the director of climate change strategies in Christianstad, and his mission is to put more fuel into these uh, cars and taxis and so on. And while he was showing me around during the day, he was taking calls on the cell phone from taxicab companies who wanted to sign contracts uh, to, uh, to be fueled with biogas. They have a lot more gas than they have uh, people willing or able to use it in cars so far, so it's a, an ongoing thing for them. To give people an incentive to convert their cars, they subsidize the conversion cost by 50% and they give them free parking for life. Uh, in other, oh, that part, that's funny. Uh, as we were parking, uh, Leonard Air Force, who is my, um, my guide, said the reason that people value the free parking is that their meter maids are very efficient. And I thought of Victoria, that would be a real inducement for us, wouldn't it? You know? But for the, uh, for the surplus gas, uh, the gas that's not burning cars and trucks, it's actually, so far, it's burned in a, um, a true cogeneration plant. When we talk about cogen, typically we burn fuel and get electricity. Uh, they burn fuel and they get electricity plus heat. So the heat goes into uh, a district heating network. And in this case, you're looking at uh, City Hall, which from the front looks an awful lot like City Hall in Victoria. This one's a little bit older, but it's heated from uh, district heating as well. The theme here is that every city I saw has district heat networks which are run partly from heat pumps from sewage, partly scavenged heat from industry and so on. Uh, Duane mentioned an oil refinery. In Gothenburg, uh, the local oil refinery was going bankrupt until it began to sell its heat to the energy company who then took the heat, used it for the district heating network and so on. And that sale of heat energy tipped the plant from going uh, almost bankrupt to being profitable. So district heating, uh, it's a whole story by itself. You're looking at uh, a hole in the ground in uh, Gothenburg with uh, a couple of district heating pipes. There's simply hot water running through insulated pipes, 60, 70 degrees Celsius in some cities with modern piping, a bit hotter. Uh, in Gothenburg, the heat pumps run about 36,000 homes uh, for heat and hot water. In Stockholm, it's about 80,000. And the brilliance of it is the way that the contracts are set up. So what will happen is that as they build out the network toward more and more communities, the energy company will sign up the owners of the homes or sign up the apartment blocks and so on. The owner will pay about a third less than they typically pay for electricity or for oil. They shut off the oil burner. The energy company then comes in and completely re-insulates their home or their apartment, triple glazing the windows and so on. They have an incentive to do that because they will guarantee that that apartment is warm, but if they can insulate it, more energy will be left in the pipe for the energy company to sell to the next apartment. And in, in doing that, they have completely aligned their interest for making money with the interests of the environment. We're completely the other way around. Uh, our energy companies can only make money when they sell us more pollution. So it's really proving the point that it's not, a, uh, it's not the case that we always have to change uh, you know, what we do. It's more how we think about waste that uh, can make the big improvement for the environment. So I just wanted to point out too that in Gothenburg, they tell me a thousand people are employed building out these uh, district heating networks, uh, scavenging heat from different industries and so on. If we were to look at doing this in Victoria, what if we started downtown? What if we started with University of Victoria, which I understand has a hot water loop and a central heating plant currently run on natural gas? If we had a sewage plant nearby, we could have the heat pumps at the plant, they could power the loop at UVic, and we could shut down that natural gas burner. Same thing with the legislature, and the same thing with, say, the Empress Hotel. Uh, with the legislature, it would be kind of entertaining to think that all those debates would be warmed by our effluent. 
And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a peculiar thing, but if, uh, if you think about um, water, it comes into our homes in the winter at just uh, about 7 degrees Celsius. It's quite cold. We do a great job of heating it up. Uh, with our, you know, our showers and uh, just passing through our plumbing, it goes out at 17 Celsius in the winter. And for someone who's putting in a ground source heat pump, they're very happy to get 10 degrees Celsius. They can get a tremendous amount of heat out of that. But at 17 is just a gift. So for us in our community, uh, we could easily heat 38,000 homes. We're not going to be able to do that overnight. But if we started building out gradually, it's uh, a direction uh, we could get there. Uh, before leaving Christianstad, I refueled at, the, uh, at one of two gas stations which carried biogas. This particular one is about 100 paces from the sewage plant. If you uh, turn around and, and walk 100 paces, you're actually in the plant. So this comes right from the sewage plant. And that's uh, the director of climate change strategies refueling my rental car. And when I drove away from Christianstad, I realized that this was uh, my first sustainable car trip ever. It was completely greenhouse gas neutral. And the bonus is that it was literally powered from the people of Sweden. Now, I kept the receipt, and it's showing that I paid about $1.24 a liter for that fuel. Uh, down the road, gasoline would have been $1.64. And this is a huge thing for the taxi companies, because when oil spiked last summer, biogas did not. They have a contract which keeps it a uh, fixed price. Uh, the other thing, if you think about it, is waste is not going to get more expensive. In fact, we're going to have more of it. So as cities grow, their uh, recovered resources will grow as well. Okay. Fourth big lesson was to integrate the planning. Uh, each city has its own company for solid waste, liquid waste, energy, transportation. These are independent companies with independent boards of directors. The interesting thing, though, is they are all owned by the city, and they take their direction from the city councils. So if the city decides that they're going to put more biogas buses on the road in Stockholm, that's what will happen. They'll direct the bus company to buy the right kind of buses and engines. They'll direct the sewage plant to produce the fuel. They'll direct the solid waste company to deliver that fuel to the sewage plant. That's simply the way they work. It took them a bit of time to do that. They started in 1995, and they've been uh, working at it since. So in our cities, I think one of the barriers that we face is that we've tended to think of waste as something to get rid of. So solid waste doesn't have really much to do with liquid waste, or so it would appear. Um, you know, and what does that have to do with drinking water, and what does that have to do with climate change? So we've tended to really build separate departments and silos and separate companies to deal with these separate issues, or seemingly separate. But in the, in the physical world, the connection is eco-footprint. So what would be ideal is if we begin to measure what we do in a city, not just by budget, not just by tax rates and so on, but by the eco-footprint of the, of the complete city. What do we do in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and how can we reduce that? So I've given some examples of how that's done in Sweden. You can see the connections already. There are communities in Australia and California that are reclaiming water for irrigation. They're doing it at a profit because they sell that water at a reduced rate for irrigation, for example. So there's the connection between drinking water and sewage. We've talked about putting the solid waste into the treatment plant, producing fuel, which mitigates climate change. So you can see the connections. That's the challenge we have, and I think that's the, the, um, the next step for us in Canada in particular, is to think, how do we do this in an integrated way? And the fifth and last lesson was that <clears throat> when it comes to cost, it's not intuitive for us to think that doing more will cost less, but it is the case. Uh, again, the reason for the trip to Sweden is I could read a certain amount on their websites, but I asked them to show me their, their budgets and their accounts and their plans. And the cost for treatment in Canada for a typical city is $10 per home per month. So that's plain old ordinary secondary treatment. We don't get anything back from it. On the other hand, if you go to Gothenburg and look at what they're realizing from sales of their energy and sales of the heat and sewage and so on, same in Stockholm, they're actually getting a return into the sewage plant. Now, the plant doesn't break even by any means, but it lowers the cost of treatment. So it's not true that doing more costs more. Doing more can cost less if we do it in an integrated way. So just to uh, go back to solid waste for a moment, we have a landfill, and it's far better than what we used to do in the year I was born. Uh, we used to take it out to the strait and dump it off the bite, and it was, you know, it would just float in the ocean, and apparently people who would go to the beach in this community would go equipped with a rake, and they would clean off their bit of the beach from all the debris, and then they'd have their day. Uh, so putting it in the landfill is a huge improvement, but we have a price to pay there too. In spite of the landfill gas capture project, which takes some of the methane out of the uh, landfill and runs a generator on it, produces power to put back in the grid, which the CRD then uh, actually is paid for. Uh, apart from that, it still puts methane in the atmosphere. 
And the problem with methane when it's not captured is that it's 21 times more aggressive at climate change than CO2. So it's far better burned in a bus, a car generator, than it is uh, escaping. So just to contrast that with Christiansted, they built their uh, plant, their biogas plant, it's a dedicated plant just for handling organic waste, no sewage and so on. Uh, they built it for $10 million Canadian back in 1995 and its cost is about $2 million per year. It uh, covers its costs from the sale of biogas and also from uh, being paid tipping fees. Instead of someone paying to take their material to a landfill, they would pay the, the biogas plant to take that material. And the eco footprint of the plant is zero in the sense that it's preventing methane from going out of a landfill. So I've got some numbers for you. Uh, the cost of plain old ordinary treatment, if you look at the cost of carrying the capital and operating and maintenance and so on, for a plant that would serve our community or several plants, rough figures, that would be $16 million per year. That's what we will be paying as a community. On the other hand, if you look at value instead of cost, and I want to say, you know, I'm not uh, claiming that we can do all of these things in the year after the plants are built. Some things we can do fairly quickly and some things not. The first one, if we uh, look at waste going to landfill, we pay as a community about $20 million a year to bury the waste. So it not only has an environmental uh, cost, it has a financial cost. If we diverted half of that away, we could save half the cost. The recovered biogas that we could reclaim from that waste stream is worth about $13 million a year in current prices. And that's bound to go up over time. If we diverted even just 15% or reclaimed 15% of the water and used it for irrigation, that would be another two million. The big uh, value though is in the heat. It's just staggering how much heat is in that sewage. Uh, going back to the temperature, that's one thing. But just imagine the weight of one car every second going out of the outfalls. It's just a tremendous amount of mass. And if you price that energy, that's $30 million a year. If we signed up UVic, uh, the legislature, which would be my first priority, and then the Empress, uh, you know, we might be doing a few million to start with, but then we could build out from there. So if we look at the uh, carbon emissions of us here in the capital, we've got direct emissions, which come from what we do to heat buildings and hot water, our cars, and uh, also landfills, so solid waste. You could also look at our indirect emissions, which are caused by the um, harvesting the materials that we take from the earth and so on. Indirects for Canadians are 16 tons per year. Directs are five tons per year. And at 1990, we were around 1.6 million tons. It's gone up since then because of all of our growth in the community and so on. And for us to get down to 6% uh, below Kyoto, we could actually do better than that. Thanks, Shane. We could do better than that if we took this step and began to divert waste away from its uh, destination today and into recovery plants. And you know, the, uh, you know Stefan Dion's, uh, Dion's dog is Kyoto. But, uh, the, the funny story behind this is that apparently there's a suburb in San Francisco where they have so much dog poop, the city put in receptacles to reclaim it. And they then looked at how much mass they had and said, you know what, uh, we can make biogas out of this. So believe it or not, uh, they make biogas from dog poop in San Francisco. These ideas I'm talking about are really summed up beautifully in a book uh, by Hawkins and Lovins called Natural Capitalism. And the theme of the book, really, I guess there are two. The first is that we don't place a high enough value on the services of the planet in accepting our waste and purifying it and turning it back into resources. And because of that, we discard. We're tremendously wasteful. So the solution to that is just to rethink waste as a resource. That's entirely the theme of natural capitalism. If you're interested in more information on what the Swedes are up to and, and what they're planning, I would encourage you to go to a couple of websites. There's a Georgia Strait Alliance website. If you just Google Georgia Strait Alliance, it'll, it'll come back. A copy of this presentation will be on that website, as well as other information about uh, treatment plans and so on. I'd encourage you to go to the CRD website. There's a tremendous amount of material there, as Duane mentioned. Uh, BC Sustainable Energy Association. And finally, I would say the Swedish EPA. If you're looking for inspiration, um, and a dose of depression at the same time, uh, start with the Swedish EPA. And, uh, and then go backwards from there. Thank you very much for your time and interest. Thank you very much, Stephen.